Uh, thank you for being here. I also want to thank the organizer before starting for uh, this amazing uh, live conference after so many months. Um, and um, one second, there is, a, this, uh, uh, there is one thing that appeared on my screen that I want to remove before I move on, which is uh, the notice that uh, this is being recorded. Okay. Um, so, good morning. Um, today, uh, in this tutorial, we'll look at many methods of uh, manifold uh, characterization. This is very connected to yesterday's talk uh, by Alessandro Laio, who explained many of the methods that we will go into today. Uh, but today we'll have a focus on practically using them and learning how to, uh, to, to use code and analyze data in practice. So, I'm Aldo Yelmo. I, um, I now work at the Bank of Italy in this uh, applied research team uh, in the informatics department. Of course, uh, opinions are mine and not from the Bank of Italy. But this work anyway was uh, mostly uh, done when I was a postdoc at CISA. Um, uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's start. Teresa. Hmm. Um, I think I have to stop. Yes, slides are not moving. So just give me a second. I'll try to reshare my screen. Going. So, first of all, why is this interesting and why is this useful for you to learn? Um, we'll know that in the last uh, 10, 20 years, there has been this really paradigm shift in, uh, in physics and chemistry, in which uh, really the scale uh, of problems that we can tackle uh, changed uh, by using uh, data. Somehow this was due by this extraordinary increase uh, in uh, information storage technology, which more was exponential, just like Moore's law. Uh, and we all know about this. This really led to uh, completely revolutionize the field uh, to, um, to what it is right now. Well, uh, in, at the same time, what is perhaps uh, less uh, studied is the increase in another quantity. So not only the data has increased, but also the dimension D of uh, the representation that uh, we used to, uh, to encode uh, uh, data into numbers, well, uh, molecules and atoms into numbers. And in fact, uh, even uh, the behavior of, uh, of the dimension D in this matrix of features has increased uh, exponentially over the years, one might argue. And uh, we, you know, from the early times in which one could just use uh, the interlattice distance, uh, well, interatom interatomic distance of a crystal to represent a material, now we are using descriptors that are the size uh, more or less of 10 to the 4, right? We're getting there. We, we, we've seen many tutorials talking about this also in the last days. And this is the standard uh, picture showing how many different representations we have now for atoms and molecules. Um, and, um, and this, of course, represents a challenge. It's not the only challenge, but it's a significant challenge for machine learning. And uh, the first thing I'd like to, you to do and to understand is uh, per precisely this, this challenge, the challenge of uh, having high dimensional data and having to deal with high dimensional data. So if you go on the website, you should find this link to the first tutorial. This is tutorial zero because it's very, very uh, introductory to uh, for what we're going to do later on. Uh, but it, I think it's very interesting. So this is really uh, a visualization of uh, why uh, high dimensional data is so much different than, uh, than low dimensional data. Let me show you this first tutorial. I hope uh, you can open it. Let me know if you cannot open it. It should be on the tutorial page of the website and the first link. And this is really, uh, I think, uh, we're, my favorite. Uh, and way in which I understand uh, high dimensional data and why is it's difficult to treat it. So uh, we just import here. Yes. Okay, so let's wait a second until it's uploaded. But uh, uh, I think this is also 
not you know it's not fundamental to run it on your own you can even run it later on the interesting thing is really to follow along here we are just uh, uh, really analyzing a d-dimensional gaussian distribution so let's imagine that our coordinates uh, xik are, are sampled from a standard gaussian uh, between zero well, and the standard deviation one around, around zero. And we all are very familiar with the one dimensional case. Uh, and we, you know, we know it uh, by heart from the our- The link should be working now, so. Okay, now the link should be working. And uh, let's look at what happens. Okay, the one dimensional case is well known. There, there is uh, all uh, the mass of the distribution is really in between, between one standard deviation of, uh, of the Gaussian. In fact, if we do the integral, we get uh, between 0 0.95 standard deviation and, zero, uh, and, and the other side, you get 65% of the mass. Okay, this is well known, uh, this is uh, intuitive, uh, and let's move on. Let, let, if we analyze the mass inside this thin shell that I colored in green here, well, that is only 4.8%. Now let's see what happens uh, in two dimensions. In, uh, in two dimensions, the mass in that thin shell grows to 7.3%, but still the picture there, it's also familiar, it's really, just that the standard deviation became square root of two, uh, and, uh, and then the, the thin shell integrates to 7.3%. Now let's see what happens in three dimension, which is still, we can still familiar, or we can visualize uh, still. In three dimensions, the thin shell grows to almost, uh, well, 9% of, uh, of the mass. Now, of course, uh, uh, it's easy at this point to do this uh, for loop over the number, over the dimensionality of, uh, of our growing space. Okay, this is still three. And we do this from one to 1024 dimension in this for loop here. And, uh, you know, at least this, I think it's surprising if we plot it. Uh, at this point, you probably understand what I'm gonna plot right now. And, uh, you know, this is very unintuitive. Uh, in uh, 1000 dimension, all the mass of the probability distribution is inside that thin shell around one standard deviation. So if we have a high dimensional space, all points are at the border of your, uh, of your dimension, of, of your space, and they are all lie on the surface. So this is something that people often say in a qualitative way, right? Uh, in high dimension, everything at the, is at the boundary and so on, but you can really see it uh, in practice uh, looking at this, uh, at this experiment. Um, this of course has, uh, has some implications uh, because in, if you are at border of this very high dimensional space, then you also have a problems with distances. And in distances at this point uh, are really always identical because you are really at the border of, the, of this huge hypersphere. And if you compute distances in a 1,000 dimensional space, you have a delta function. All points are at the same distance from each other at the border of this high dimensional sphere. Um, this of course has huge problems if you want to apply any algorithm that you have uh, learned, for instance, in the past days, you want to apply kernel regression, uh, or, uh, or, well, or even the techniques that Alessandro Laio described yesterday, this is a problem because there is no concept of, of proximity. Everything is just at the same distance and orthogonal from, uh, from the rest. So we just understood that uh, we have uh, very high dimensional uh, spaces in chemistry and physics, and these high dimensional spaces are challenging and you cannot do any machine learning with them. So why is it the case that we instead can apply this algorithm and the algorithms work? Well, the reason was already mentioned yesterday and is the fact that uh, data is not, it's never truly high dimensional. So since there are strong constraints in the physics and chemistry of atoms and molecules, you will never have a Gaussian in a thousand dimension like data set. Because you know, if you take a box, and you start to randomly put atoms in it, you will never, you will find almost surely infinite energy configurations that are not going to happen in reality. So in fact, data lie on this very much lower dimensional manifold that is, um, that is the physically motivated uh, space for atoms and molecules. And so 
this is really what we're going to do today is we're going to investigate the properties of this low dimensional manifold of dimension small d embedded in these very high dimensional spaces of dimension large d which can be 10,000 now uh, so you, we will learn to um, estimate in practice the intrinsic dimension d of the manifold which uh, we'll see it's orders of magnitude smaller um, we will learn to estimate the density of points directly on the manifold. And uh, we will learn to actually taking this density to estimate the peaks of this density in a statistically significant manner. Um, and finally, well, we will learn to do all of this in practice using a software package that we are developing uh, and, uh, it, and it's open source, it's called DataPy. So what we will not do instead is to learn uh, to find the coordinates of this low dimensional manifold, which is the task of uh, dimensionality reduction techniques like PCA, isomap, kernel PCA. And this has some advantages because we are not interested in the coordinates. And this means that even if our manifold is complicated, it's not topologically equivalent to a surface like Alessandro insisted in, in explaining yesterday, you can still apply these techniques and have uh, accurate results. While if you try to, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, to find the one-dimensional space connected to the manifold I'm showing here, you will have problem because it's just uh, there is no way to make it one-dimensional. Okay, um, so these uh, are the people involved in uh, in uh, the development and of the ideas and the software behind uh, DataPy, and in particular Yuri and Diego are the experts on idea estimation. So if you find them around, there should be uh, many of them are here today uh, and. Uh, available even for uh, uh, dealing with the package. Uh, Matteo is uh, the expert on ID estimation. Alex uh, is really the expert on uh, density peaks estimation. Romina is the working on uh, something that's in that I will not gonna talk about. It's called the information imbalance. And there are other contributors uh, that I show here. Of course, I also want to thank uh, my funding for my postdoc, uh, Max, uh, the, the Max uh, collaboration. So this is the outline for today. It, the tutorial is divided in three parts. Uh, the first part is on intrinsic dimension estimation. Then we're going to talk about density and density peak. And finally, the idea is that uh, at the very last time, uh, for people that are interested, we are going to help you to install the package and run the package on your laptop, on your own data, okay? Um, which should be also doable for, uh, for people that are interested. The first part will be a brief theoretical overview, well, a brief recap of the theory behind the intrinsic dimension estimation and a practical session. In the second part, we'll also have brief theoretical overviews and a practical session. And in the third part, uh, we'll just help you to install and use the package. So now I pass the word to Yuri, who is gonna uh, overview the theory behind the intrinsic dimension estimation. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, intrinsic dimension. Uh, as, Aldo, as Alessandro told you yesterday, the intrinsic dimension basically represents the minimal number of the coordinates that are necessary to describe the point of the data set without, uh, meaning, uh, without uh, information loss. It's important because if you attempt, for instance, a dimensional reduction, it is a strong lower bound, so that if you attempt a projection on a, um, on a manifold, whose intrinsic dimension is lower than intrinsic, on a dimension which is lower than the intrinsic dimension, you will, uh, you will lose information. So as Alessandro was uh, underlining yesterday, the problem is, the, is that the intrinsic dimension is scale dependent. So here, there is a very simple example of this behavior. So if you focus on this small region, on this small scale, you see that the intrinsic dimension of this curve, for instance, is three. Differently, if you enlarge the scale at which you look the data set, here you can describe the data set just by using a, a single coordinate so that the intrinsic dimension is one. Once again, if you look at the picture as a wall, once again, you find intrinsic dimension of three. So in our package, uh, we developed uh, with the, the method that we use to estimate the intrinsic dimension is the so-called 2NN estimator that was developed by Alessandro in, uh, in the last years. The method is very simple and relies on a really um, low amount of information. The idea that for each point, you compute the distance from the first and the second neighbors. You know that the, the ratio of this quantity, which we call mu, is uh, distributed according to a Pareto distribution whose exponent uh, is, uh, is basically related to the intrinsic dimension. And once 
you once you have uh, um, found all the empirical mu i from the distribution of your points, you can infer the, uh, the, um, the intrinsic dimension. How about the scale? Well, uh, in our package datapy, we provide two different methods to find the, 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 scale, uh, the scaling of the intrinsic dimension. One is a simple decimation on the data set. The idea is that uh, you, provide, you use the standard to an end algorithm, but on a, a lower, on a subsample of your data. You essentially uh, just take a subsample of the data, of course, um, the, the spread is the more uh, aggressive the decimation, the farther the point they are, the larger is the scale at which you look. And in this way, you are able to profile the intrinsic dimension as a function of the scale. Another uh, option is provided by uh, the, GRIDE, um, the GRIDE algorithm developed by Diego, who is here. And the idea is that uh, instead of decimating the data set, you look at farther distances of neighbor uh, in a way that uh, the first neighbor is the second neighbor is at twice the the distance of the first one, and so in, in this way, yeah, there is a another profilation of the D, and you will see in the um, in the tutorial how the two methods uh, are uh, slightly different but still provide a, a similar information. Uh, uh, bonus: What if, uh, for instance, your feature lie on a disc, on a on a lattice and your uh, distance are discrete? Well. You can see uh, this, uh, this afternoon in my poster, I will show you how to deal with this kind of data set. So now, uh, Haldo for the, for the tutorial. Thank you. So um, hopefully now you will have a link to the second part, to the second tutorial, which, is it online, Claudio? Okay, so um, here, um, we, we, we do two things in this tutorial. In the first part, we, we use the, the algorithms on very simple data sets just to get what we know we should be able to get. And then we'll do something more complicated on a, uh, on a research question of a few years ago. We'll re reproduce the main result of this new RIPS paper. Um, so let's start by importing the standard packages here and install DataPy on Colab. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, well, of course, uh, we're always happy to answer. Also, uh, well, if there are questions on the chat, uh, maybe Claudio and the other organizers can let me know. Then the main uh, class that is interesting uh, to use and to know how to use in DataPy is the data class, as we'll see. So we start by importing it and uh, well, this is a helper function. And then, as I said, we start on a very basic uh, case of a manifold without even uh, noise. So this is the standard, super standard um, Swiss roll. You can see that the intrinsic dimension of uh, this manifold is two. And since there is no noise whatsoever, even at a short scale, the, the, the manifold is really flat. So. If we want to compute the intrinsic dimension of this manifold, we initialize a data object like this with coordinates uh, uh, x of the data. We can even initialize it only with the distances, and this is something we'll see later on. And then we use this method, compute ID to an n, which takes this optional parameter, which is the decimation. Decimation one corresponds to using, so decimation is the fraction of data used for computing the ID. So decimation one means we're using all the data. And so we're looking at a short scale. So if we run this, we see that the scale at which the ID is computed is 0 0.38 and the ID is two. So if we go and look at the graph, this is really the scale. It's there on the right. So on this short scale, the manifold is flat and uh, the ID is computed to be two. If we change the decimation, uh, if we change it to 0 0.1, the scale increases. You see, it's now 1.2 and the intrinsic dimension is still around 1.9, well, around two. These, uh, um, these, the intrinsic dimension, the scale and so on are also attribute of the class of the object that we have initialized. Now let's go at a slightly more complicated case and more interesting. And it's the case of a manifold with a bit of noise. It's the same uh, Swiss roll manifold, but this time uh, 
uh, the, um, there is a three-dimensional noise. This is seen from the fact that, you know, in this uh, right uh, graph, uh, the, the points are scattered all around this three-dimensional space. So once again, we initialize uh, our object uh, with this new data and we compute an N to an N uh, ID with decimation one. Now, decimation one, once again, means short scale. So what is the ID that we expect uh, for a short scale in this case? I hope you, um, I hope you uh, have this clear in mind that at a short scale, the, the manifold is three-dimensional. So by running this code, uh, ah, well, decimation, or well, probably we didn't initialize it with the new data. That's what happened. So we have to run this. Otherwise the data was, was still noiseless. And now we have this new data set and at the scale at a short, um, well, the ID at a short scale is three now. And if instead, if we decimate, we, we retrieve uh, these uh, two dimensional, uh, well, you have to decimate more aggressively, presumably. And we will you will recover that the ID is coming, uh, is going to, towards two. As Yuri mentioned, it's interesting to look at a decimation analysis at, di at different scales to understand whether there is a plateau and there is a constant ID for different scales. And this is done in DataPy using this command, return ID scaling to an N. And this is the minimum number of points uh, that one wants to use. And you see that uh, the scale goes from three at a short, the ID goes from three at a short scale to two uh, with this plateau, uh, as you expect. The same thing can be done in DataPy using also the GRIDE algorithm. And, uh, and you find more or less a similar thing with a similar graph. Of course, you can go on this link and look at other examples of ID estimation on other data sets. Uh, it's also interesting to compare now uh, to an N and GRIDE on these uh, other data set, uh, one dimensional data set embedded in uh, three dimension. It's a spiral data set. Let's look at it. So you see, this is one dimensional and uh, you see that GRIDE really drops uh, much more quickly to the true ID than uh, the to an N decimation approach uh, because essentially it doesn't have to sub sample the data set. Now, I hope everything is clear and the usage of DataPy, uh, is, is, I think it's very intuitive uh, uh, and it's very simple. Not, now we can apply it to a more interesting uh, problem. And this is really computing the intrinsic dimension of uh, hidden uh, layers of neural networks. Now we have a, a ResNet 152 architecture. This is a convolutional uh, uh, deep network for image recognition. And uh, we want to compute the ID in the input layer. That means that each of the node of input represents one coordinate. So if we have, uh, you know, 1000 pixel, this is 1000 dimensional space. And then each of the hidden layer will have a different uh, uh, representation for our data. We'll take uh, the distances of uh, imaginate images inside these hidden representations. And we want to compute the intrinsic dimension of these uh, representations. So. Um, here we download the data set and, uh, and the data set really consists of these uh, compressed files, uh, uh, one for each layer that we're interested in. And each compressed file is uh, composed of two arrays. One is array of distances and one is array of indices. You see the distances are only or up to the 30th, uh, 30th nearest neighbor. So it's a very sparse format to, to store distances. But since we only need the, the nearest neighbor, we can allow, well, we can run this very kind of large scale computation on 90,000 points, 90,000 images only in a fraction of seconds. Um, we so initialize our data object that I showed before here using only nearest neighbor's distances. So up to, the, up to the neighbor 30. And we do this in a list here. So there is a list of objects and each object contains distances of ImageNet for a specific layer. And these are the layers we consider from zero, which is the input to, to the output and some layers in the middle. Now here we compute uh, on a loop the intrinsic dimension for each layer of uh, this uh, uh, neural network, okay? And then we assign uh, just uh, uh, the results to this uh, uh, array here called ID. Now, 
Presumably, now if you follow me, uh, you have now a picture in mind of how the intrinsic dimension is supposed to change with the, the intrinsic, well, the, with the hidden layer. So at least when I first thought about it, I thought uh, since the network is learning more and more structure in the data, the intrinsic dimension should really decrease from the input layer to the output layer. Now, these, uh, the, the unintuitive result that these people uh, proved with this algorithm is the fact that uh, now if we plot the intrinsic dimension as a function of the layer, we have this uh, uh, unintuitive and characteristic uh, and now really well-known shape in which the intrinsic dimension first goes up and then it goes down again. This was explained and understood by the fact that there are uh, correlations in the input layer that lower the intrinsic dimension. Uh, things like uh, gradient of luminosity or colors, uh, uh, things like very, very basic attributes of images that are not related to the classification between cats and, uh, and monkeys and so on. While, uh, uh, well, this kind of correlation needs to be destroyed. And this is what happens in the first part of the network. Uh, and then uh, more interesting correlations are uh, constructed in the second part. And so the, the idea goes back uh, to a low number uh, and actually even much lower number only in the second part of the network. Okay, so this was uh, our first part uh, on, uh, on intrinsic dimension estimation. I hope you could run the collab and uh, let me know if you have problems or if you have questions at this point, uh, because then we will proceed to, uh, to the second part, which is on density estimation. Yes. So just so I understand correctly, what's happening right now is we are, we are, just, we are still at the level of trying to figure out what the underlying uh, dimensionality of the data might be. And so we're not doing anything like feature selection or dimensionality reduction yet. Exactly, no, we're never doing this. So this was part of uh, the, the, it is very important that you raise this up. So we are never going to do an explicit dimensional reduction. We will never find the intrinsic coordinates of the manifold. We just uh, do computations on the manifold without the necessity of building a low dimensional map. This, has some, uh, this is powerful because even if the manifold is complex like in this figure, which you wouldn't be able to, you know, to, to make it one dimensional if you wanted to, you can still compute the intrinsic dimension in a meaningful way. You compute density and then density peaks of the manifold. So, the, um, so this is really by design, a choice by design of not having dimensionality reduction the techniques in, uh, in this package, but only uh, these techniques that can uh, compute quantities uh, without any explicit dimensional reduction. Okay, and then I have one more question. So um, in the examples that you gave, like with the spiral, uh, it was clear that the intrinsic dimensionality was- Was one. One, mm -hmm. um, but then for a neural network, one can only like kind of try to argue what the intrinsic, what might be happening, right? Yes. So how do you reason about that this is exactly what is happening rather than just right. trying to reason, say it okay. It's a good point. So in fact, what we've done here, it was just take, uh, we, we didn't do any scale analysis here. So the way in which you can be sure, or at least you can uh, um, be confident that the intrinsic dimension is well estimated is by looking at this graph and finding a plateau. Right. This is the way you validate your estimates. If you find a plateau, you can be reasonably certain that this is a meaningful estimate. And uh, we haven't done this for the neural network analysis. Uh, we because well, we didn't have time, but they did it in the paper. They did this scale analysis for each layer, and they found that in fact the intrinsic dimension remains low and remains of that order, independently on the scale of the scale that you look at it. So yeah, that was a good question. And we haven't shown that, but I, I, there is a link to the paper uh, and uh, definitely worth looking at it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, I apologize if it is a too simple question because I'm not an Never. expert in this field. So. If you don't really do dimensionality reduction, what would be the benefit of finding the intrinsic dimension in for modeling or for treating but, high dimensional data? That's, a, that's also a good question. There are, I think, two answers. One is that typically the intrinsic dimension can be interesting on its own, 
as a, as a proxy of, uh, well, as, a, as an information of your, uh, of your data. So, you know, you don't know much of your data, but if you know that the intrinsic dimension is uh, 1000 or whether it's, if it's five, really changes, uh, you know, the, your understanding of your data set of the correlations that are in it. And also, you know, it can be even a preliminary step before doing a dimensional reduction. So if it's 1000, really, you know, you can do PCA or you can do a kernel PCA, but what you're looking at, it's not meaningful, right? If the intrinsic dimension is high. And then the other thing is uh, now, I think this is a perfect question for, uh, for, uh, for this moment, because the other reason why it's important to estimate the intrinsic dimension is precisely because it allows us to estimate density accurately directly on the manifold and the density peaks, which is interesting on its own. Because you, well, I, I will give you a little spoiler of this picture, but I think now um, Matteo will explain this in more details and you'll understand better. So thanks. So, um... Can we treat these as a way to improve the interpretability of deep learning methods? Yes, for sure. In fact, this I think uh, was one example, the one we showed in which the you know, understanding hidden representation of neural networks is challenging. People have tried doing this with the low dimensional product projections uh, and uh, some, with some success, but of course you cannot plot it in two dimension if it's not two dimension. So definitely these techniques can be useful to interpret uh, uh, deep neural networks. I gave you one example. I will give you another example in a few minutes in which we use other techniques again in the hidden representations to understand what's happening. Now, this is definitely a possibility. Yes. So I have one more follow-up question. Sure. So is there an assumption that the intrinsic dimensionality remains the same in the data? Because just to think about it, if you have like a bunch of points and then they are all spread out like flat mm -hmm. on a piece of paper, and then let's say you're moving along the x-axis, they, they kind of spread out and then flatten back again. Yeah. So then the dimensionality is low. Yes, let's I think two. this is also a very good question. So and then it goes up and then down. So, so then, the question is why are, how can we be sure that the intrinsic dimension is everywhere constant, right? Yes. On the manifold. Yes. Uh, we cannot be sure. This is going to be always approximation apart from uh, uh, rather trivial cases. There have been algorithms and uh, techniques developed to estimate, uh, well, to partition your manifold into pieces of uh, uh, identical intrinsic dimension. So it's about clustering technique based on intrinsic dimension. So look it up, it's called, uh, I think, Hidalgo with an H. Um, however, for the purpose of, uh, of the techniques that we will use later on, like density and density estimation, it's sufficient typically to take this constant idea assumption, which will uh, well turn on into an approximation. Essentially, we, have, we estimate the mean uh, intrinsic dimension across all the possible variations. And we take that as, a, as somehow the, the target, and we use that. Definitely, there is space for improvement there. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, Matteo, go on. Hello. So, density estimation. So, suppose uh, we are in a, in a feature space uh, of embedding dimension capital D, and we want to understand how data in this uh, space are distributed. As Alessandro mentioned yesterday, uh, one possibility is to use the k-nearest neighbor estimator. The algorithm is very simple. You fix uh, a hyperparameter k, which is a num the number of neighbors we consider for every point. So for every point, we look at the distance uh, RK of the case neighbor from the point uh, which uh, describes uh, a hyperspherical region in embedding space of volume VK. And so by assuming that over the region delimited by this radius RK, uh, the density is constant, we can simply compute the density uh, by dividing the number of K by the volume the, the, these points occupy. So notice already that this is a, a sort of a, an adaptive algorithm because uh, by fixing K, um, the uh, selected scale of the model is different for every point. In fact, if I have a high density region, uh, we will have uh, uh, denser points, so the, the k points 
are in a smaller radius, in a region of smaller radius, while if we have a lower density, the selected scale will be higher. Also, notice this is a, a non-parametric method. It only looks at data locally, so it can handle well uh, complex topologies, which is a, a problem that Aldo mentioned before and also Alessandro mentioned yesterday. Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, we here do not uh, define we do not perform an explicit dimensional reduction. So to connect uh, uh, to the questions uh, uh, with the audience, we only look at distances basically. And uh, now it'll be even clearer um, the, the, with the question uh, regarding the intrinsic, uh, the intrinsic manifold. In fact, uh, we know that data are uh, distributed on a manifold, the intrinsic manifold of lower dimensionality with respect to the embedding uh, dimension. And so basically, as we see in the picture, um, here we have a Swiss roll in, 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 two dimension, in three dimension, but uh, the intrinsic dimension is evidently two. So uh, it is important to uh, divide the number K uh, by the volume computed on the intrinsic manifold. In fact, if we uh, divided it by the, the, the volume in the embedding space, we would basically dilute the information of these K points over uh, irrelevant empty directions, let's say. So uh, this is why it is uh, very important to uh, have an accurate estimate of the intrinsic dimension, small d. The other thing we have to uh, fix is of course the hyperparameter k. And uh, how do we do? We would like to include the, uh, the most point possible because uh, we want to uh, basically reduce the variance of our estimates. But of course, if we select a K which is too big, uh, we would introduce a bias in some points because uh, it would select somewhere, some regions over which the density is not constant. So um, we, we should select a, a, a K uh, for which uh, the scale um, which selects a scale of, over which the sample is uh, locally uniform. But these scales uh, vary across uh, uh, the data set. For example, here is a low density region, uh, uh, slowly varying. So uh, the density looks uniform over a high radius uh, with a fair amount of points. If we move uh, towards the density peak, uh, we see that the density is varying sharply. So uh, the density is locally uniform only on a small radius, but uh, since we are in the density peak, we have a lot of points. And here, instead, we are in, uh, in the same density condition as in the green case, but uh, then the density is varying sharply, so the, uh, the radius is selected is small and we select uh, fewer points. So this is why uh, we developed uh, the algorithm that Alessandro explained yesterday uh, to uh, compute for every point uh, the optimal number of neighbors uh, to consider adaptively. So together with this improvement, we obtain an even more adaptive version of K nearest neighbor, uh, which considers, uh, as I said, uh, an adaptive um, specifically calculated for every point value of the neighbors. And uh, I stress the fact that uh, the adaptivity of the algorithm uh, helps to uh, basically mitigate the uh, bias variance trade-off that we mentioned yesterday and today. And so uh, to handle better higher dimensionality. So one possible improvement is uh, uh, to allow for uh, linear corrections uh, to uh, constant density or free energy uh, in the sense that a k nearest neighbor can already be um, formulated uh, deriving it from a likelihood model. So if we see the formula here in, at the bottom and we consider it without the, the blue parts, if we maximize uh, over f, where f uh, I indicated is uh, minus the logarithm of the density, uh, we maximize it over f that uh, already returns uh, the uh, k nearest neighbor density. But we can uh, improve it by including uh, 
uh, linear order corrections to uh, the, the free energy in blue. And this uh, uh, returns uh, PAC, which is the algorithm that Alexandro validated yesterday and uh, that we will uh, also test uh, see at work in the tutorial later. As we see here, the maximization is carried out independently for every point i. And by doing this, we consider the, the estimates at every point independent. But as we see, we consider ki points for every estimate. So these estimates are actually correlated uh, and uh, not accounting for these correlations uh, basically uh, gives uh, uh, estimates that are uh, statistically uh, unbiased, so they are correct, but they're kind of noisy, oscillating. One possible way to uh, treat this problem is by uh, correctly account for correlations by considering the, uh, the density gradient. We can estimate the density gradient by realizing that, uh, which is what we did, we realized that basically by considering the sample mean shift, the average of all these vectors, which are the vector connecting the central point of the neighborhood with all the other neighbors, the error, the colored errors, basically. But if we, if we average, if we do the, the sample average of all these arrows, we get a vector which, is, uh, which captures perfectly the gradient direction. And in fact, we are also able to compute exactly the proportionality factor. And uh, so we are able to compute correctly the free energy gradient and the density gradient. And we can use this information to obtain a smooth uh, free energy or log density uh, profile. But you can see my poster for more details. Now I leave the stage to Andre. So um, so after we computed the density, we can estimate the density peaks. And I'll be brief on this because then we'll go straight to the tutorial, uh, the, the, the density peaks of the, of the distribution. So the estimation of the density peaks has uh, these steps. First of all, computer density, we can use any algorithm. Pre preferably we would use PAC because it's better, but not often, always we cannot use it. Uh, not, we, can have, we cannot use it all the time because maybe we have uh, data that doesn't have many neighbors. We have, we have some constraints, but anyway, the algorithm of density peak estimation will work anyway. So anyway, we assume that we have some kind of estimate of the log density that I'm showing here. And then what we find is uh, the maxima of the density. Now, in this case, you can see uh, that uh, uh, in the picture below, the maxima are indicated by the red dots. So you see that there are maxima that are not really, that are part of the same density peak. And this can happen because the, the estimation of the density is, is prone to error. And so you will find the non-statistically non significant maxima. So we need a technique to get rid of non-statistically significant maxima. What we do is that we find the saddle point between any couples of peaks of maxima and we decide to join two peaks if a specific condition is met. And the condition is this one, that the difference in the logarithm between a peak and a saddle point uh, uh, and any saddle point of that peak should be larger than Z times the sum of the error on the peak and on the saddle point, right? In that case, you see the two peaks and you see that perhaps uh, the middle peak, peak is too close to the, to the central saddle point, and you might decide to merge these two peaks into a single one. You do this operation, you see, uh, and, uh, and then you, you find your, um, your partition, the partition of your, of your data set into density peaks. Then uh, we'll see how this works in practice, and we'll get also a bit more into the details. Um, Another th thing that I'd like to briefly mention is uh, how you then can estimate uh, um, um, a visualization, a very interesting and powerful visualization once you have learned the peaks and the saddle points between the peaks. So let's assume we have this data set and uh, we can start by the two peaks that are separated by the highest saddle point. So somehow the saddle point in them is the highest in density. And in this case, they would be six and two. So what we do is we agglomerate or we combine these into a single element. Um, and then we uh, recompute the saddle points between these agglomerated uh, element and all other 
density peaks as the minimum with respect to, in this case, six and two of the original saddle points. Um, and then we do this iteratively uh, until there is only one peak left. So this is a procedure that generates this dendrogram visualization that it's really interesting because you can, okay, in this case, it's easy because you can even visualize it in 2D, in, 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 uh, but it, this visualization can be done arbitrarily even on high dimensional spaces. So you see really the topography of, uh, of these density peaks. So six and two are close to each other and then they merge with the peak number three and then they merge with peak number four. And on the other hand, you have got five and seven and eight that are close together and so on. So if you learn to interpret these, uh, these pictures, uh, I think it's very powerful on any kind of data set that has an interesting structure to analyze. Um, so now we will look at this in practice in our other tutorial. Let me know if you can open it. And also let me know if you have got questions on the uh, small, uh, the short theoretical overview of these methods. Okay. And once again, we will do uh, two things here. So first, uh, understand how the algorithm works on a very simple data set. And then we will apply it to analyze hidden representations of neural networks. So, um, importing packages, installing datapy once again uh, on Colab because it doesn't come with Colab yet. <laughs> then we import the main class. And the toy illustration here is uh, more or less the simplest thing or close to the simplest thing you can imagine. And it's the one dimensional uh, double uh, hill potential, double hill density. Let's um, wait for this to appear okay and the first thing we want to test is the density estimation in data pi we sample a data set from this simple density we assign this sample to the data object uh, with the, the usual command and we compute the distances max k is the variable that provides the maximum number of nearest neighbor that are stored in the distant matrix um, and then we compute the okay, this is just a very short exercise, you know, uh, a trivial exercise, but why not doing it? You know, we just check that the intrinsic dimension is one. Um, and then let's move on the estimators. We've got three estimators to test. One is the standard super simple K and N. So, um, and then we have more advanced and adaptive version. Let's start with the K and N. And uh, KNN takes this free parameter K and let's start with K equals 10. There is something interesting we can learn by changing K. So this is a plot of estimated versus real density. And you see that K10 really gives you a good approximation on average of the true density. This can also be seen in this other graph in which you have true density in black and predicted density in uh, blue. And you can see that on average, K and N gives a good estimate, but the variance is huge. And this is of course due to the fact that K is small. The variance decreases as one of the square root, uh, actually the variance decreases as one over K. So we can decrease the variance easily by increasing K. Uh, and let's see how, what happens if we increase it to 100. Uh, well, to 100, you see the variance diminished considerably, but you have a problem of bias. So the estimates, are not true, not even on average, at least uh, in, in, well, in, in this case. And you have this huge bias in these regions of, uh, of density in which you're just completely wrong. Um, this is really why it's interesting to, to develop new and uh, more adaptive uh, algorithms. And this is the job of uh, PAC. Let's, say, let's use PAC directly here. And uh, PAC really takes automatically this uh, bias uh, Let's run it again. Um, anyway, PAC gives you automatically some kind of trade off between bias and variance, in which, uh, well, I don't know, something went, uh, I don't know what, what but um, let's reinitialize this. Hmm. 
there is there is still something maybe to be fixed because it's a bit strange. It should be a bit better than this pack. Uh, anyway, anyway, um, and you can even see the adaptive uh, k star. So this is the adaptive k for each point. Now, um, I hope this was relatively clear. It was uh, rather uh, obvious in a way. But let's look at how instead we can estimate density peaks, uh, starting from an estimation of the density. Um, anyway, so we start with the same data set. I, I, on purpose, I subsampled the data set uh, in uh, only 200 points and using a, a, on purpose a density estimator, which is not great because we want to show, otherwise, the problem would have been trivial. So the well, first thing we want to do is to estimate uh, the density peaks, so the maxima, the local maxima. And with this uh, estimation of the density, we find three maxima. And uh, of course, we know that the real maxima are only two. And uh, we proceed to an assignment, a preliminary assignment of, uh, of points to density peaks, which will be wrong. So this is what happens inside this algorithm once you run it. There is this initial assignment. Now, I think this is not uh, very visible, but it's, um, well, it's a cluster. It's a, this is another one and this is another one. And this is a wrong assignment. That's where the merging process uh, comes in. And uh, as I, I told you before, the, the condition for, to, for a peak to be statistically significant is that this distance is, go, is uh, well, this is not significant if this distance is smaller than Z times the sum of their error. And we can look at the, these quantities on this graph. On this graph, we have the peaks, the saddle points, and the error on these quantities. And you can see that this peak and this saddle point really lie within the error of each other. And so this presumably should be merged in the merging process. We do then this uh, clustering, uh, well, the estimation of density peak with a value of Z. We can use Z equals one, for instance, and look at the result. Uh, well, of course, they have been merged. Uh, we can, of course, um, this was easy because uh, we knew the distribution. We knew that this, thick, that this peak was not statistically significant. However, this, even in general, can, there is a way of understanding that peaks. Well, first of all, a value of Z of, uh, should be taken between one and five, never at zero. Let's assume that uh, we took a value of Z equals zero. Then we could uh, have looked at the dendrogram even uh, without uh, further information on the density. And uh, we see for that the, this peak is very close to where uh, the saddle point lies. And so this is really an indication that we should increase Z because I mean, uh, also Z was zero in, uh, in this case. Um, and also I think it's interesting to see the correspondence between density and this dendrogram analysis. Of course, if we increase uh, Z, we will uh, merge the two peaks And uh, the dendrogram will look different, but still, uh, you know, one to one mapped to the density there. So I hope uh, this was clear. Let's see what happens uh, in uh, deep neural networks. Once again, the, the, the data set is the same as before. So let's just download, re download it. So it's a data set of ImageNet with uh, 300 classes. And for each class, there are 300 points, a total of 90,000 points. And we also download this time uh, labels uh, that give us um, whether a point uh, corresponds to essentially a macro class of animals or artifacts. And these are actually the classes, the specific classes. And uh, we once again import uh, all these uh, points inside a list of object uh, of data objects. And we also import the class here. Okay. Um, now let's compute the density using a simple K and N with K equals 30. Since uh, K, well, since we only have 30 neighbors, we cannot really do the adaptive search over K. And that's a good reason to use uh, maximum K, which is already not very large. And then we compute the density peaks using advanced density peak classing, which is the algorithm I just described. Now, this you see takes uh, really, uh, seconds, which is great, even though 
the you know it's ninety thousand points, and we are talking about ten layers, so it's it's not a super easy computation, but we have fast code written in Cyton. Um, now num number of peaks. These are the number of peaks estimated for each layer, and this is already somehow interesting and connects well to what we have seen in the previous tutorial. The number of layers first it decreases to one, the number of uh, peaks, and then it increases again, similar to what what happening in the ID estimation. So there is some structure in the in in, in the initial layer, presumably related to colors and gradients and luminosity and so on, that gives us some peaks. And then this gets destroyed in the middle of the network and interesting peaks start to arise after. Now let's look at these peaks and what these density peaks represent. We do this by a simple representation. Well, here we're plotting it 2D, but it's not really a two-dimensional representation because the distance in this plot is proportional to the saddle points. So points that are close together in this plot have a, have a density, that density peaks that are close together in this dendrogram that I showed you later. Now we are in layer 148. We see that many peaks arise. And what's interesting is that they already are divided between animals and not animals. So let's go a bit earlier even in, the, uh, in our network because I want to show you that the distinction between animals and artifacts is actually learned by the network earlier. And this is seen uh, by the fact that uh, these networks predominantly, well, these peaks predominantly um, uh, have animals or artifacts already early on in the network, already at layer 142. And, uh, and then of course, uh, the, the distinction becomes finer and finer as we move forward in the network. And in the last layer, let's look at it. The last layer, we have essentially one peak for each class. So there is one peak for dogs, one peak for monkeys, and one peak for table or whatever. And um, another, the last thing I'd like to show you here, uh, which I think is very cool, is an analysis of the dendrogram of the last layer, because there will be a rich structure in the last layer in terms of peaks and saddle points that, we, that will give us some intuition on what the network has learned. So we, uh, we take just the last layer. Here, what I'm doing is that I am uh, um, removing, just for visualization purposes, all the artifacts. I want to focus on animals. And uh, you get this dendrogram, which is still very large because there are many points. Uh, and it's very interpretable. Now, um, unfortunately, you can't really zoom easily with uh, Using uh, using collab, but if you run this locally, you can zoom in into couples of peak of, of uh, peaks. And for instance, if you take two peaks here, eighty eight and eighty nine, which where are they here? They are very close to each other in this dendrogram. In fact, they are two species of uh, of uh, butterfly. If you go and take uh, three and twenty five, which are also very close, they are two owls, and and so on. You have hairy dogs and underwater animals that are, that are in the same mountain with peaks in the same uh, agglomeration of peaks. Somehow, then this was the result of this paper and this somehow is the picture that you can get out of it if you analyze it better, where you have, first of all, mammals and non-mammals. And then you have within mammals, all the dogs inside uh, a, a mountain with all peaks in this mountain. Then you've got monkeys and other mammals, sea animals, uh, and so on, insects, uh, birds, uh, and within similar to birds are butterflies, but of course they are not really, but they're just close. And so it's very interesting, uh, you know, to perform this kind of analysis. And uh, really this uh, lets us uh, see in practice that the network has learned this uh, hierarchical phylogenetic structure automatically uh, by, by gradient descent. Okay, um, questions on uh, this tutorial? Because then we can proceed to a bit of a summary and then we'll try to download the, the package and use it. Yes. So if I understand correctly, what's happened so far is uh, we have used k-nearest neighbors to somehow do like density estimation. Yes. And so k-nearest neighbors, of course, has the k as the parameter and that we saw. But then unlike k-means where you need to specify the cluster centers, you don't need to do that here. So exactly. somehow it figures out how many cluster centers there are exactly. automatically. Right? Is that true? Yeah, that is true. 
Yes, and it's a one important aspect. The other important aspect is the fact that we have access to the saddle points, because mm -hmm. this is what uh, this doesn't come with the uh, k-means, and this is what gives us the possibility of doing this kind of analysis, because we have really a uh, right uh, a lot of information. You know exactly what what is the the saddle point between any couple, any couple of peaks, and that is very really informative. Mm. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, again, uh, related to this question about kind of the relation between estimating the density peaks and clustering, I guess the difference is that in clustering, every point gets assigned to a cluster, and here not every point gets assigned to a density peak, or does it? No, I think, uh, the, um, no, no, it is, it is the case, even in it this case. case. It's just that uh, I think uh, density peak uh, is just a specific type of clustering based on density. I think uh, it's a synonym for density-based clustering. It is similar to HDB uh, scan and uh, other algorithms uh, that work like that, uh, but uh, it's better in, uh, in the sense that it's, there are fewer parameters and yes. But then I have a follow up. So still being, I mean, if I imagine this, maybe this is my head being too two dimensional, but if I imagine this like a map, mm. like a topology of, you know, Europe or something, and I have the Alps have lots of peaks, mm. and then I have regions that are very flat, okay. northern Germany. Okay. Um, so it seems to me that this sort of method would be biased towards the places where the peaks are, which is also where most of the data is. But like, what about the, the places where there's a lot of sparse data that is far away from peaks or is not forming? Any? Yeah, this is a very interesting question, you know, because essentially, you know, I, I, would never, I wouldn't have thought about this problem uh, on my own, but essentially it came up as a real problem that had to be solved. For instance, uh, when analyzing uh, molecular dynamic trajectories, you have this problem precisely because um, uh, many, you have these vast regions of space uh, of very low density that are essentially metal stable states, uh, states stabilized by entropy. And this technique doesn't work as well as it could, uh, you know, it, it doesn't do it precisely what you want it to do. And in fact, uh, there, uh, there was another algorithm developed precisely for that, which is also in DataPy and we don't discuss. And it's called the K peaks clustering. So the idea there is to use uh, the optimal K as a proxy, well, as a fake, uh, let's say, um, as a, a fake density for density peaks. So the optimal K is, uh, gives you a large number also in the region where the density is low. So you find that as a peak, even though the density is low. And this is how you can solve uh, that problem uh, for the specific cases where this is, uh, you know, it needs to be solved, like in this molecular dynamics. So there, I will give you a reference later on and we also can discuss it, so thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so right now, these techniques uh, give the probability peaks and the saddle points, right? I didn't get you. Sorry. So this technique gives probability peaks and the saddle points. Yes. Can we systematically improve it to get, say, the width of the peak and so on, so that we can create generative models? Uh, so can you systematically improve it to give you more information about the probability peaks, like ah, okay. the width of the peak, or you know, some sort of like for instance, uh, you were talking about generative modeling. Yes. yes, so that we can build generative models out of it. Yeah, so uh, this was actually also asked yesterday and I, I thought it was an interesting question and definitely something uh, possible and that should be done. Uh, honestly, there is no excuse not to do it. Um, it's not implemented in the package and I think it's still uh, an active line where we should first think about what's the best way of, uh, for instance, sampling for, from the density that we have learned. But at the moment it's not possible. You know, you can think of many heuristic ways of doing that, uh, but you know, there should be a serious analysis of what is the best way of heuristically or uh, less heuristically sample from, because there is a lot of information. So it's impossible principle to build a generative model. There are just so many ways to do it that, that, that we should understand what's the best one. one Thanks. Uh, hi, thank you for an amazing tutorial. I have two questions. So uh, the second depends upon the answer of the first. So, uh, if I have understood it clearly, 
this uh, you are using the concept concept of intrinsic dimensions with uh, this knn so that you can divide it by the uh, hypersphere volume of hypersphere with the mm -hmm. dimensions of uh, your uh, the intrinsic dimensions basically yes uh, is it true true yes yeah. okay so the second question is then if i uh, if i'm trying to compare it with uh, algorithms like density based uh, spatial clustering with noise db scan mm -hmm. or hierarchical db scan then there the only problem is that we do not have this concept of intrinsic dimensions so they create a lot of problem when you go higher in higher dimensions right so am i following Correctly. So that this is, is uh, not the only difference. Okay. Uh, there is one difference. So it is true that they don't use that information, but it is also true that there are other differences in the sense that they estimate the density some differently. Uh, they estimate the peaks differently. So it's not the only difference. And also they don't estimate saddle points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, th yeah, thanks. Well, the fantastic talk. We have seen in the linear case that uh, something density correlates with the ability of the model to, to learn. So high places with high density are uh, easier to be predicted. Yes. Do you find the, also this correlation for the case of deep models and, uh, for example, classification of uh, animals? I, of, uh, um, honestly, I wouldn't know how to validate that hypothesis. Mm. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible, but since we don't know the, the, the true density here, what uh, I think could be done is that we could look at uh, um, higher dimensional still uh, known uh, distributions and look at what happens there. And I don't know what, uh, what they found because uh, I think Alex Rodriguez work on that uh, and I, he knows uh, what happens even in higher dimension. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to ask him. I think uh, it can be possible. We'll think more about it. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so uh, let's wrap up and go to the third part. Um, okay, so in a nutshell, we have learned how data are very different uh, in high dimensional with this uh, hypersphere example and tutorial. We learned that instead this uh, is not really a problem because uh, in practice due to physical constraints, uh, data have uh, strong correlations and, uh, are, uh, and live on lower dimensional manifold. And we learned how to analyze uh, automatically this uh, low dimensional manifold using a series of uh, algorithms to an N, GRIDE, KNN, PAC, uh, and advanced density peaks. We did everything in DataPy, and DataPy stands for distance-based analysis of data manifolds in Python. And uh, one of the key features of this package is the fact that it's distance-based, so you can make it work even if you don't have coordinates. So if you have just uh, distance, and in fact, even uh, nearest neighbor distances, like we did in the neural network case, you can still uh, get all the information you want and you can make the package work well. This is the case, for example, of ge genomics, data set, DNA, distances, uh, and there are plenty of way of uh, data sets in which you don't have uh, an explicit space, you just have distances. So the goal was really to provide easy access to these fundamental methods of manifold characterization. It's fast because it's uh, the bottlenecks are programmed in Cyton and it's unit tested. Uh, the, the code style is guaranteed by these LinkedIn tools. Uh, they, there is an extensive automatic documentation and Jupyter tutorials. And of course it's on GitHub. So, so with this, uh, I want to thank once again, uh, the people uh, that worked on, on this package um, and also sponsored the posters of the tonight and my, my funding. And uh, with this, so these are some references that perhaps I will give you um, better with the slides later on. And uh, let's go to part three. So with this, I'm finished and uh, we can start uh, this uh, experimentation, which can go even through the coffee break for people who want, <laughs> uh, who want that. So thank you. Thank you very much for the 
presentation it's Florial and uh, so we have 10 minutes to well within yeah, okay. uh, the the hour and 20 minutes to try to install it so by the way there is uh, Yuri Romina Diego Matteo and me who can help you to solve problems of installation and analysis also uh, we prepared an optional uh, well if you if you don't want to, you know, if you don't have a data set uh, that you would like to analyze immediately, you can analyze a sample data set that we provided online. There is a link to download uh, a folder. Uh, and in that folder, there is a data set. And there is also a Python, a Jupyter notebook uh, for the analysis of uh, that notebook, of, uh, of that data set um, with, uh, with the dendrogram analysis and all. So maybe you can try to access that if you don't have already a data set. Uh, well, I think you should download it anyway because it, it has a sample uh, Jupyter. I will open it up. Um, I think uh, it's this one. You will download this notebook. And uh, really just uh, essentially is uh, you will have the main commands, you know, the, in the initialization of the data object, the distance computation, intrinsic dimension, pack uh, advanced density peaks and the dendrogram for instance um, so i think uh, ah by the way yeah, even if you have a periodic uh, space you can uh, you can uh, use the package by specifying a period or even different periods along different coordinates ah the link they are asking for the link uh, so the link is on the web page as the other ones, as the last link, I think. Yeah, I think it takes a couple of minutes to reload, so. Yeah. And yeah, this is also the uh, the data set uh, that's, uh, yeah, they're still asking for the link. So let's see if I can get it. So the link should be here, hands on tutorials. Yeah, that, that's this, this is the one. It takes a little while to download because there are also the, we should download the whole thing. There are also the, the VMD visualizable trajectory here of the file. This is, a, uh, this is the example that we give in our archive paper that I'm gonna show you. And it's just the, the, the example data set that we analyze here in the fin figure five. So it's just a way to reproduce this data. Anyway, I think uh, with this, I really want to try to help you use the package for, uh, for a data set that you already have. I just want to show you the final, uh, the kind of graph that you should be able to get is this one um, by analyzing that data set. Anyway. So anyway, I think uh, this finished, uh, finishes our tutorial and uh, we'll be here from now until the end of the coffee break uh, to help you install, use and explore uh, DataPy and your, and your data set. So thank you once again.